Food education is more than just putting a pan on a stove and chopping up ingredients. Portland Public School received a grant inviting anyone in the educational realm to provide summer classes for children. So we decided to do outdoor cooking classes at the Fabian School where we had individual cooking stations every Tuesdays and Thursdays for children to come out, do cooking classes. We also live streamed it so everyone could have access to cooking classes. And we also streamed it through Zoom to individuals who signed up in our local area. When it comes to our classes, the mission that we have is empower, educate, and serve through food. Are we, are we live? We are live. Oh, we're live. Okay, cool. Perfect. It was an amazing opportunity for us to be able to educate people in a hybrid model, both in person and online. Welcome to another amazing class. I'm super excited you guys are all here. Thank you guys. And my co-host today is... Shara Anslow, OSU, and thanks for having me on. Shara also was someone who I've worked with in the past and her teaching method is funny and we really get a good chemistry when it comes to how we talk with each other and teach with each other. I work for Oregon State University Extension Service and I teach nutrition in the Portland Public School Districts. Giving kids critical perspective of food and helping them have a foundation for knowing how to put a healthy meal together, knowing how to prepare food, and knowing how to be safe with food. Well, having her there was kind of a one-two punch of having kids learn about cooking and also being able to understand the more nutritional side of the food that they're making. And this is our like first time actually doing it in this space like live. The reason why we did ramen today, first it's Japanese food and second it's delicious. It's gonna be great, I'm excited. For Japanese katsu ramen, I thought it would be good to introduce the my plate to eat foods from every food group. Putting foods in groups is a way of capturing the essential nutrients that's in that group and making sure that you're getting all those nutrients in your body every day. Ramen week, I'm a big fan of noodles and soup. The first week was I, I was a ball of energy and emotions and trying to figure out like the best way to take all of this information and transform it into simplified, digestible information. Making a dish like ramen or pho or grandma's chicken noodle soup gives kids the opportunity to take what you have in your kitchen, take what you have in your fridge or in your pantry, in your cupboards, and make a delicious, nutritious meal out of it. It went so good and the food was good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> First day of virtual classes, it was fun. And the cool part about this class is like seeing all the individual like bowls of ramen and kids around. That was awesome. And honestly, I just feel kind of blessed to be able to talk with everybody and get everybody involved into cooking again, especially for the summer. Question, we got questions? If you want to separate the cloves of garlic, the easiest way is the old school method where you get, take the bulb of garlic and you just smash it with your hand. Another way to do that is by putting it underneath the cutting board and pushing and leveraging the cutting mm -hmm. board to smash it up. And then you can just kind of like peel them individually, but there is another method, which is the bowl method, where you put it in between two bowls and shake it up, and it actually peels the garlic. But another way is, of course, buy peeled garlic. I really enjoy how he talks to kids, how he prepares food, and just his personal perspective. Jacobson's perspective on food is awesome. And then we have our clove, which, by the way, this is a good trivia question. What everyday condiment has clove in it? Anybody, think about it. Everyday condiment. You probably put it on your eggs. Ketchup! Nice. Yes, yes. good yes. job. 10 points Ketchup over here. Ketchup has clove in it. And yeah. it's actually a very distinct taste. There are kids who need that in person, that tangible touching things kind of education, but also there is a lot of lack of access to quality education in this country. If we are gonna do a class, why don't we make it available that anyone can watch? We're gonna talk more about Spain because we're going to take one of their amazing dishes called tapas. Tapas means little plates, and we're gonna have our own little plate party. So we're making chocolate bruschetta, we're making some crostini, 
We're making also Papa Brabus, and then we're gonna be making our sun-dried tomato pesto. I love making pesto because I love pasta. Anytime you can make something that goes on pasta, it's a win. Actually, you could probably put it in anything. I'm pretty sure you put it on rice and it'd be delicious. I really want kids to understand the importance of the different cultures of food they eat. And I think that's why it is super important that we try to highlight as many different cultures and countries. Food is a universal language. Even if all the food is different, it's still a universal language. We all connect through food. So we just got done with our second week of virtual cooking classes. This is the last day for us to kind of get in a rhythm and understand like how things are going to be in person. And I think a lot of kids are nipping at the butt to get out and be around other kids, uh, especially during the summer. This is going to be the first day of in-person classes. Let's go. <laughs> Starting with virtual classes and moving to this was a perfect transition. I'm so excited. Excited to see all the kids and help work with them. I'm prepping the stations for everyone, so I'm getting everything out. So I got cutting boards, graters, knives for leaving in the bucket, there's spoons, balls, and induction burner. We've got all the power terminals are going in. We've got our cameras all set up. Tables are in position. We're kind of getting the last bit of things all rigged and into place before classes start admitting students in at 9.30. You know, this is the culmination of a couple of months worth of work to get us to this point. I guess eating it after. <laughs> I would say how you can like just get out of your head for a while and like not worry about everything else and just focus on a task for a while. There we go. When we worked on the chana masala, it was really, really interesting to see that we were showing people that protein doesn't have to be a meat. As the world moves away from consuming so much meat and then every meal doesn't have to have a meat protein and then it can be tasty and delicious. And to note that everything, a lot of the things that we do here, we're gonna take and move on for the rest of the weeks, like toasting spices, taking very good care of soaking the beans versus buying it already soaked in a can, like all of those processes and procedures was very, very vital. I love eating it after, but I think my favorite part is just like cooking everything, because it's really fun. Well, my favorite part is going to be eating it, but <laughs> cooking on the stove, that's my favorite part. Um, I usually make scones, and then she eats them all. Same thing with pancakes. When I actually took a step out of the kitchen and started doing some volunteering and working with children, I realize that they need more mentors, they need more good people to teach them a positive thing. And I think cooking is very positive. It's really good. Really good. It was really good. I like to see how many spices you get to put in like a whole, a whole meal. I'm not a big onion fan, but I wish there were more onions because I really like the crunch. Pretty fun. I put too much salt. But it's too good, I can. I can't stop myself. Kids are really fun to work with. There's a lot of hope in kids, and I feel like if we're gonna change the future, we have to inform children. They are the upcoming generation that will shape how food systems work. Outside of school, there should be programs like this that teach kids skills from people who are passionate about what they do, and that is, that's, that's this. That's what this is right here. It was good to learn how to make the rice because I actually love rice like that. Now I know how to make it the way they would if we were in India or something. It's been a great day. A lot of the kids had a really good time. The food was bomb. All in all, it was a great week. Today we made the Asa chicken. Today we are in West Africa. We're learning a little bit about Yasa chicken. I'm really excited because Yasa chicken is super easy but super delicious. And the cool part is there's a little science behind it. People don't know that onions are a tenderizer. The juices from onions can actually tenderize meat. So do a little science on that. I like the part where we touched the slimy chicken because it kind of felt weird, but also it was fun. So with Yasa chicken, first of all, amazing dish. I wanted to introduce whole grains. Really important to get that fiber and to eat whole foods and taking care of yourself and learning to cook is so important. It is especially important to empower kids and help them learn how to cook. Your relationship with food is also your relationship with your health. We are empowering children to take control of what they eat and also take control of their education and also learn how to educate themselves. Even though it is food, it's a catalyst for other things. It's a catalyst for people to learn how to create 
something that can literally change the world. You never know. Taste lemon, chicken, onions, olives. <laughs> nice. Pretty much everything we cooked it with. Especially in the West Africa, rice was very popular because they had rice patties. And when we're talking about the slave trade that went from mm -hmm. Africa all the way to America and end up in North Carolina, a lot, of, a lot of the influences in growing rice in Africa was transferred to America and put in North Carolina. So if you ever went to North Carolina and you tried out the rice patties, um, it was a very big thing. Black community has its own culture of food, and I think for a lot of kids, it was a good first step towards that and have them understand like the culture behind it. Also understand the simplicity and the importance of understanding different cultures. And I think when it comes to African cuisine, there's not a lot of African restaurants in Portland, so we need to kind of expand people's palates when it comes to actual African foods. Look at this olive bite. I love olives. I like olives a lot. Actually, a highlight was just a couple minutes ago when parents started showing up, and then the kids wanted to feed them food. It's very good. Thank you. The biggest service that we teach them is the importance of giving, and the importance of being able to make something and give it to someone. It's a magical job because anytime you work with food, you get to learn the unique perspective that everyone has in their relationship to food. It's really an honor. Today, we are going to Thailand and we're going to teach you guys how to make some green curry. Let's talk a little bit about spices, such as the green chilies, the garlic, the coriander, cumin, cilantro, and lime are also used in Mexican cooking. So now, this curry paste is something we can use not just in Thai food. We can use it in Indian food. We can also use it in Asian food. We can also use it in African food. It's kind of the same kind of similar qualities. It's just all about really understanding the culture behind it. Showing the importance of the spice, showing the importance of like taking very good care of these small ingredients. Because many of the spices that are used in Thailand are also used in Mexican food. Chilies, cumin, cilantro, all those flavors. And I like to think about us as a global community sharing food. So I always want to bring people back to exploring food ways and looking at the crossover. Every food has a story, the culture behind it, how, how one culture uses it uh, compared to another. When it comes to our classes, I really want children and parents to understand that their culture is part of the representation that we want to have, that their culture is important and their stories are important. Tastes good. You guys should try this at home. I recommend. Amazing. Delicious. Delicious. I like eating it and chopping it. Because when you smell it, it's just like, oh my gosh, I can't wait till it's like, it's so good. The second class was one of our biggest classes and everybody had an amazing time so I'm, I'm really happy and I'm really excited for uh, next week. Tonight we are going to Italy, the birthplace of one of the most popular dishes in the world and the number one dish that everyone asks me how to make, pizza. The term pizza was first recorded in the 10th century in a Latin manuscript in southern Italy and comes from the root word paesia which means blackening of the crust by fire. We're all connected through all of this food. The world is connected through all of this food. So we gave them a passport and they stamped it every week. And it was really, really fun to, to talk about all of the different cool topics that we, when we traveled together. We're gonna be using rockfish today. There's some kids who are gonna be doing salted cod at home, which is more traditional. And then there's gonna be some onions, carrots, habaneros, garlic, thyme, vinegar, and then of course, making a dough has flowers. That week was really special for me because that's part of my culture growing up. So I came from a household where mom would fry off some bread and then in that same pan, she'll wipe it out and then she'll make some of the salt fish and being able to share that piece of who I am and kind of where my culinary background started from was really special for me. The fish seems like really good, but also the flatbread. I put extra salt on my bread. It's a bit salty but it's really good. The food looks really yummy and I can't wait to try it. My favorite thing is the bread thingy. I think when we talk about diversifying the education system when it comes to black chefs or chefs of color, to see have black boys see a black man teaching cooking classes outside of the entertainment industry is huge. Being an example is important and the same thing with Jamal him being an example for other children to see a black man 
teaching and educating and showing love and showing compassion and understanding, giving them the ability to experiment and learn something new. I also think it's super important that people of color also help represent other people of color. I seek out understanding other different cultures of food just as much as I seek understanding different cultures of people. Being a person of color and being an educator and being a chef, these all tie in together. Having a black man role model is really valuable. We need to build diversity into everything we do. Jacobson is hugely inspiring. His passion about food and his patience. Jacobson's patience for kids is really important and it stirs happiness. And that's what's really important as an educator. The diversity that we have brought to the table and that we will continue to bring to the table is very, very vital for the culinary scene. And to have kids be able to see us in these positions, give them an opportunity to think outside of the boxes that they were already in. It's life-changing. I didn't grow up with chefs that looked like me, so here we go. Oh, you put down your fingers? Jacobson would always say, okay, take your time. This is fun. He made sure that they knew that this was for fun. This wasn't academic-based, even though what we were learning was academic-based. So he taught me how to shift what we're learning to appeal to the students. Being able to be patient with a child is a foundation to having them be able to learn from you. If they understand they can trust you and they understand that you are not there to rush them through it, you are not there to go through the process and be done with it, but you're willing to let them make mistakes. Make sure that you're there to support them through anything that they go through, that you're willing to be there until they get it right. That's patience the inability to leave them no matter what. I gotta have that for kids because they're kids. We get to create good habits with them. We get to create good memories with them. My favorite part was eating the food after we cooked it. My favorite part was chopping things and eating the food. My favorite part was cooking the stuff by ourselves. For the first time the kids get to cook fish and they did a really good job. The fry bed part was actually very important because they learned how to fry something. For them to be able to just like learn how to use a fryer properly and gracefully and they were they just owned it. They got really comfortable using knives. A lot of the knife skills we've done multiple times so to see them just being like boom 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 getting it done with it was super awesome. Um, the biggest thing I saw with the kids is just their confidence. I mean that was like the biggest thing that I'm happy about is just seeing everybody confident about what they're doing, handling the food, chopping, eating, everything. So it's it's amazing to see them just own the kitchen. Welcome to the last week of our classes. First off, I want to thank you guys for hanging out with us for the last eight weeks. We did the Lebanon class fully online. This week we'll be heading out to Lebanon. Exciting to work with some hummus and some pita. I thought that was really special because once again, we took meat away from the equation. Talking about my country and my cuisine was, it was a dream for me. It's hard to find a lot of people here who know much about the Middle East, let alone the food we eat. These students now have a ray of knowledge that they didn't have before. It's fun and I got to meet people and made some yummy food. The kitty claws, that's something I didn't do really before when I was cutting stuff. But now I know how to cut my onions in a safer way, so. I've learned a lot of like soft skills. And I would do this cooking class again. <laughs> a lot of fun. Um, I enjoyed trying many different foods from um, different cultures. And I've learned a lot of new techniques. The progress that these children went through. It was really awesome to see kids just be like, I'm gonna give this to my mom and she's gonna love it. Or I'm gonna give this to my dad and he's gonna love it. Or I'm gonna give this to my brother. Can I take some extra? They couldn't wait to give it away. That was, I think, one of the best moments I've had this entire summer. I had so much fun. I did not expect to enjoy my time teaching as much as I did, but I had to learn how to speak to a younger generation, a younger audience. Food is not just fuel, it's also comfort. It's also family, it's friends, it's different countries. I think that this was just one small step towards something that we can inspire other schools 
to adopt. And this method is going to be something that can really change the educational world that we live in today. One of the things that was super valuable is the, the number we reached. We had over 70 participants this summer. People talk about food and they talk about their experience with food. So when you teach a kid to cook and they share stories, you're teaching a community to cook. You really make an impact not only on the student that you have right in front of you, but you know it's impacting their family and the larger community. Cooking is important to me because that's how I show love. The biggest thing I could ever do for my mom and my grandmother was to cook them a meal. In a world where we don't get enough gratitude and we don't get enough love, it takes effort, it takes time, it takes consideration. They really understand cooking now. They understand the importance of cooking because it's not about just doing it for themselves. It's really, I want to do this to give to someone else, which again is love.